Welcome everyone to the Inspired Choices Network TV show. I am your host, Christine McIver. Today we have a wonderful guest, Karen Leslie, that we're going to be speaking to and we're going to be speaking about happiness beyond suicide and depression. Now, I just want to tell you a little bit about Karen. Karen's been working with Energy Now for over 20 years. She began with an introduction to Reiki. Yes. Since she studied a number of different modalities, she's obtained the master's level in some of them giving her the opportunity to teach what has worked so well for her. Karen has a strong belief that everything we do to help ourselves from the neck up will help everything from the neck down. I love that. Uh, her journey to healing, her own depression, anxiety, suicidal tendencies, and more has contributed to a life that is now filled with excitement and new adventures. Each day now offers new possibilities that could not even be imagined before. So true. I'm <laughs> sitting here with you right now. <laughs> so thank this you for is so me. cool. I love it. Now, Karen, you're a facilitator of change. Yes. So let's talk about the changes in your life. Let's begin at the beginning. So where were you born and raised? I was born in North Bay, Ontario. North Bay? North, North Bay, <laughs> yes. Yeah. I was there. Um, almost didn't come, home, come out of there, actually. I almost died when I was three months old. Wow. So I arrived, I think, and went, ooh. <laughs> this is a little much. This is a little much here. I'm not sure what we're doing. Um, so I spent the first couple of years up there, and then uh, my father's job I moved, and we grew up in Toronto. Okay. And spent really my whole life in Toronto. Went away to go to university because I was like, I need to get out of Toronto, out of home. It was a little intense. A little intense, yeah. Okay. It was. Um, my mom was never well, and I was far more aware of that. I understand now. Today, you understand that you were aware. Of yeah. Now, when you say aware, what do you mean by aware? Like cognitive knowledge that she was ill? Well, both, like both, always, because um, when I was about three, I witnessed a, a complete breakdown. Okay. And it, that terrified me. All of a sudden, she was gone. They took her away. Oh, And wow. she was hospitalized for, I don't really know how long. I just know I was at a neighbor's house. It was... It was just myself at that point. My brother wasn't born yet. Okay. And so the, from that moment on, I really got the idea, if I use my voice, bad things happen. Why is that? I witnessed this explosion of her and yelling at my father, and oh. she had a complete emotional breakdown, and I was hiding under the dining room table, and I just thought, so if I yell? That, this People is go what away. Happens. People go away. Wow. And so. And from a young age of three years old, you carried that with you. Yes, for a, yeah, forever. So did that have you kind of withdraw from speaking up and and being seen in the world? Totally. I became the peacemaker. I became the person always trying to help my mom look after her. My poor brother grew up with two moms. Oh wow. Because there's seven years between us, and I just stepped into that role to try and make it easier for her. Thinking that you were totally trying. doing the right thing. Yeah, totally trying to help. I mean, the poor guy now, I mean, but yes, <laughs> you know. And, 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 you know, that must have impacted you, stepping into yeah. this mother role when that really wasn't your place. Yes, yeah, yeah. So let's move forward. So you leave Toronto. Where, did you go to university? Did yeah, you I go went to uh, Western in London. In London, Ontario. Yeah. Okay, great. And what did you go to study? Uh, sociology and psychology. Yeah, <laughs> going to fix me. <laughs> <laughs> you were going to get educated how to fix yourself. Yes. All right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a new way of doing it, but I'm sure there's lots of people out there who have done that. Yeah, uh, okay. Didn't work. <laughs> didn't work. <laughs> didn't work. No. Okay. No, that's when actually it was during university that the anorexia hit. And uh -huh. then th so I was actually feeling like I was losing control even more. So more things just started to surface at that point as well. Okay. So had you been up to this moment, had you been struggled with depression and suicide at this point? Like, when did that all start? High school. Yeah, in high school. The, um, definitely the depression was probably around the age of 16. Okay. Um, Can you pinpoint what you were depressed about? Was there, were there triggers or was it just an overall feeling? Overall, like I just, I thought, why, why am I here? Like, what can I contribute? There, I just felt like I was 
invisible. It was, and I was invisible, really, because people would meet me, and they'd forget they had met me. Wow. And then they'd meet me again. And that went right through into my 50s. So did you want to be invisible in the I world? I did, because I, I was too uncomfortable. Afraid? I just, I was a great chameleon. Like, I just blended in so well. And then I, I thought that this was awesome, because from that place of actually being more invisible, I thought it gave me more power to help people. Okay. That I could be the supportive person in behind. Right. And I didn't, I didn't want to be seen. You didn't want to be seen. Okay, so now you move forward, you get married. Yes. And you have two beautiful children. Three. Three children. Three boys. Three boys, wow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so what's occurring in your life during the marriage and the children? Are you still depressed? Yes, yes. And we married agreeing no children. Um, I didn't want to bring any children into this world. I changed my mind. I don't know why. I truly, truly don't know why. It just all of a sudden seemed like something to do. Okay. Um, and looking back, I actually think that it was a way to give myself a reason to be here. Wow. And I've often said that my boys have saved my life on more than one occasion. Because you felt an obligation? Mm hmm So it wasn't that they were stepping in and doing what you did what you did for your mother and your brother. Mm -hmm. They weren't stepping in being the mother, were they? Were they? No, they weren't being the mother. But as they got older, I recognized, again, looking backwards, that times when I got very, very close to taking my life, one of them had a crisis. Say more. So, um, yeah, like a, a major concussion would come forward. And I'd think, darn, I, I, I have to help my son. I, ca I can't leave now. He, he's ill. And this repeat, this, this these repeated, these things has, continue to repeat? Numerous times. So how many times, and, and I don't want to make light of suicide, but I, you and I have talked about this before. Yes. I have probably a different point, in suicide, uh, point of view on suicide than many people. How many times did you literally plan to leave? Wow, that's a tough question because it, Okay, literally planned, because it was in the back of my thoughts almost constantly. Like, I, I'd wow. be driving and I'd think, oh, I could just go over that bridge. Or, like, so, the, so it was always there, but actual planning, I'd say four. Four times four that you times had, you had, that like, I was this actually, do. this is what I'm doing, that's, and this is. And you started to put things in place yeah, for when you would leave. Make arrangements for people to be, family to be gone, or whatever the case may be. Wow, and did anybody around you know that this was the, a permeating thought and that you planned these things? No one knew the planning. My husband knew the thoughts. Okay. And because there was times when I would literally just be crying in his arms saying, I just gotta go, they're fine. You're a great dad. You can look after them. I gotta go. And okay, so were you seeking help? Were you going to doctors? Were you going? You know what were you doing? Yeah, I had many counselors. I did try a couple of medications that just sent my body into awful tailspin. So didn't you know? Didn't do that. And then that's one of the reasons I actually looked at the energy work. Okay, thinking so that maybe that maybe that would help me because the other roots really weren't making any difference for me, and um, but even when I was doing energy work, I still was in and out of counselors for a long time. So when did you start um, the energy work? Twenty years ago? Yep, about twenty years. Yeah. And you started in Reiki. Well, yeah. Well, actually, Reiki is the one I I tell people I started with. I actually started with something through my church called Healing Pathways. Okay. I was a little nervous of Reiki, to be honest. I didn't know what this universal energy was. <laughs> Because okay. I was very involved in my church. Yes. So they had um, people from uh, British Columbia came out to Oakville and offered these courses. So that was my first one. But Reiki was the, the first course that people recognize as a okay. healing modality. Okay. Yeah. And so what did you start to find as you, because you continued with the energy work. So there must have been something in there that was beginning to change for you. Well, really what it was is I saw I could help others. Again, yeah, you're so still I wasn't others. helping me. I, like I'd get little bits of help, like I would feel a little better for a while. Right. But I always fell backwards. 
Okay. And so then I would, you know, think, okay, I'll work on it a little bit more. But it would be really the energy work was helping my children or helping some of my friends or like, and I thought, okay, well, this is cool. I can still be of some help here. I can still be of some assistance to people. But then I usually would slide back pretty far. So it was the, as you found something that would contribute to other people where you could utilize it to help them, it gave you a little bit of hope, a little bit of respite. Yes. And then it would wear off. Yes. So you weren't receiving the happiness. You weren't creating the happiness. No. And, and you really weren't being the facilitator of change for yourself. Nope. Right? So nope. It, it, it's nearly like a false happiness, right? It, like it, it, it ends when, when you're trying to do it for someone else. Yeah. And I wouldn't even have used the word happiness because I forgot what that word even meant. Like I had no concept of what would make me happy anymore. Wow. It was just 30 years of, you know, I would think, oh, this is maybe. And, but I really couldn't tell you what made me happy or what happiness was. Okay. There's wow. Not a clue. That's a long time to, to have that on your shoulder. I just became a really good actress. I, I guess, guess you did. Yeah, because I would be happy at birthday parties and be happy at events and be... But as soon as... So you were stepping into roles. Yeah, and as soon you, as I could get out of it, the better. Like, I just, you know, yeah. Right. It was exhausting. I guess that's why um, so many people are surprised when, when some people choose suicide. And they often say, I had no idea. Yes, absolutely. Because people can act it so much. Um, it's something that I have also had a challenge with in the past. And I can remember um, oftentimes thinking, feeling genuine joy. Mm-hmm and nearly simultaneously feeling massive depression. I totally understand what you're saying. And it's hard for someone that's not been there to get that. Yeah. But it's not like you are or one or the other. It was there together at, at the exact same time. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna go for a short break. Okay. When we get back, we're gonna continue speaking with Karen Leslie, all about suicide, depression, and how we can step into happiness. Stay tuned, we'll be right back. Have you thought about bringing your voice to the world? Are you looking to have a global platform that you can connect with? At Inspire Choices Network, we create an opportunity for you to bring your voice each and every week to a global platform. We support you, we train you, we bring your podcast out to more than 50 platforms. We are a network of building a community where we're bringing conscious voices to the world. If you're looking to have more of an opportunity, if you're looking to bring what you know to the world, do connect with us. You can contact us at inspirechoicesnetwork.com or you can send an email to becoming a host at inspirechoicesnetwork.com. We'll have a conversation and we'll show you what truly is possible. Welcome back everyone. We're here with Karen Leslie. We're talking about happiness beyond suicide and depression. Uh, Karen is a facilitator of change and we're talking about the changes that she has gone through. So before we went for break, we brought us up to the point where you realized that helping other people was giving you a short-term happiness. Right. So when did that begin to change and how did you change that? Because that is not who you are today. No, I'm so glad <laughs> that's not who I am. It, it changed, started to change almost five years ago when I went and learned a new modality. And it opened a door for me that I hadn't been able to open before. Okay. And I was thinking about it literally actually driving in, wondering, so when did all this really change? Because it was gradual. Like, it wasn't uh, an overnight or a hit in the head type, like, oh my gosh. Like, it wasn't a light switch. Not at all. It was very gradual. And I think partly because I was wondering if it was too good to be true. So I was... You didn't, you didn't want to believe it and be disappointed again. Yes. Is that right? I, yes, I was very cautious and very, very leery. Didn't want to really admit to myself or anyone else what was going on. Right. And then um, Suicide Awareness has an international awareness and prevention month in September. Yes. So it was three years ago that that was happening, and I thought oh, I'd always love to do something about this month to help it. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, I'm not strong enough yet. I can't do this. Two years ago, I did. 
okay. and then last September. So this coming September will be my third year where I can promote and help and talk more. So somewhere in that, you know, three, three and a half years yes. ago, yes. then I knew that I was actually on the other side of this. And the other side of it. Yeah. So the healing modality is? It's access consciousness, the bars. Okay. And then with having my bars run, as it's referred to, also a number of tools that I was using to help me understand really when I was thinking of something, like, is this actually my thought? Okay, so explain that because it sounds really weird. It is, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. I found by asking myself, who does this belong to? Or actually I shortened it, like, is this mine? When a thought would come into my head, that I'd find that the thoughts weren't mine. I don't know who they belong to. Every now and then, like, oh, my mom's would pop into my mind or I'd hear my dad say something or there'd be references like that. Yes. But to be honest, majority of the time when I said, okay, is this mine? I just got no and no idea where it came from. And so I worked with this a lot when I really dedicated to working with it and realized that almost nothing in my head belonged to me. So then my anxiety went down. Okay. Um, so the anxiety disorder I'd been diagnosed with started to leave. And then as the anxiety started to leave, then I noticed the depression was getting lighter. Okay. And then as those lightened, then thoughts of suicide just became less and less frequent. Okay. And then it was sort of like, wait, do I actually really want to leave? And I was afraid to say no. I was like, is, is this true? Like, am I actually... Again, worrying about being disappointed? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, whole idea of, is this mine? It's what I know is that we have memories, which are forms in thought, mm -hmm. which are actually in the neural pathways of our brain. Mm -hmm. And our brain repeats, repeats, oh, yes. repeats, right? <laughs> yep. And so what you were doing is you were picking up on those repeated thoughts that were stored in your brain somewhere. Yes. Right? In some cases, that's where you were picking up. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes, like, uh, we will think, oh, is that my, was that my mother? Did she used to think that way? Or was that my father? Or, or someone in our lives. Yeah. But explain more when it wasn't them. How were you picking up other people's thoughts or feelings, and how were they your? Like, how were you aware of that? Well, our bodies are just energy, right? That's all we are. I mean, the table, the cup, everything's energy. Science tells us all that. Yes. So some of us just have more fine-tuned sort of receivers in our body. Like we're basically like walking antennas. So I had my antenna, I think, just dialed up a little high. <laughs> I was picking up on everything. You were picking up on another channel. I was picking up on many channels. Okay. And so I was understanding or picking up on things from people that I didn't even know. Not, and not even necessarily in my city or my country. Like, we can pick up things very far away. Okay. But we are also taught that if we feel something or sense something in our bodies, then it must be real and true. It, it must be ours. Okay. So I just was very happy to buy into all of this as being mine. So if I was anxious and I was having a panic attack, then the thoughts that were with it, well, it's, it's me, that's, it's mine that I'm doing this with. So until I could understand that there's actually a lot of people around that have similar thoughts and feelings. Like, I thought I was actually unique having thoughts of suicide because I wouldn't tell anyone and I didn't know how common it was. So if this is actually as common as professionals tell us, then how many times when I was thinking of suicide was I perhaps picking up on other people who were unhappy and thinking of suicide. That's an excellent point. So do you know how common, did you, did you find any stats on how common it is for people to be thinking of suicide? Yes, and I'm not remembering them in this 10 seconds. Oh, that would be <laughs> but, great information to have. But it is, it's ridiculously common. Like we, there are so many people that have thoughts. Now, far fewer plan and take an action. Yes. And far fewer, again, are successful after choosing an action. But the number of people that are unhappy, and I, th I feel like we're a, a self-fulfilling prophecy here because many people are thinking about suicide, and then we pick up on each other thinking of suicide, and I, or we're keeping each other stuck 
in, 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 that, in about, those patterns, in yeah, those thought patterns. Those it's, that's very, very interesting. It's, um, you know, it's, it's funny because I'm th just thinking about social media. We are all so more connected on a, on a physical level, even though it's through the internet. We are so more connected. And when you see a post and you, you see a picture or a post or someone saying they're having a hard day, it's so easy for us to go, I get it. I've been there, right? And the minute you do that, you can feel your energy shift. Yes. You can feel your emotions shift. Yep. So because, do you think that the, because of the social media, because we've become a, such a, a very small community around the world, do you think that thoughts of suicide have increased because of that? I think it can certainly contribute to it, yes. I think our world in general is struggling more and we have circumstances that we've never had to deal with before, so I think that contributes. Yes. But yes, it's so much easier now to tap into it, to be exposed to what's going on around the world than we had 40 years ago. You know. Right, so understanding, really getting a, a cognitive awareness and understanding that you're picking up on other people's thoughts, that you are aware of other people's thoughts, mm -hmm that began to change and move you into happiness. Totally. It gave me like a, a whiteboard eraser and I could just say, nope, that's not mine and take that one out of the equation. Wow. And then another one would come along and I think, nope, not mine. I, I almost like hashtag, no, that's not me anymore because I'm truly discovering who Karen is and having that board just sort of cleaned off is so exciting. But knowing that we can choose that, Yes, knowing Total that we can choose that is just phenomenal. You know, un un unfortunately, I have had a number of people in my family choose to leave via suicide, mm -hmm. and I often think of them, and I often think of the individuals that they were. And, you know, there's lots of different personalities. I come from a very large family, and these personalities of these individuals, the one thread that I can see in all of them is they had so much hope. Uh -huh. They were, and, and today I know they were all very empathetic. Mm -hmm. So how much were they actually picking up on where people were at in their lives and the sadness, the, possibly the suicide, and, and I'm not saying that they didn't choose it for their own reasons, but how much less would it have been if they actually had this awareness that you've discovered? I, oh, it's a great question because I think that people who really struggle in mental health in general are just those fine-tuned antennas. They've just, right. their volume is up, their antennas are wide open, and they're just taking on so much information that we have no idea it's not ours. Right. And being able to discern and figure out what is yours and to be comfortable with like really almost nothing could be yours because that could be unnerving too because then it's like, who am I? Then who am I? Yes. Right? And mm -hmm. that for me for a little bit was like, oh, wait a minute. What do I do with that? And I wonder too, Karen, and maybe this is diving a little too deep, we might have to do a second show. <laughs> um, but I wonder too of how much um, that actually stops people from really diving deep into it because you, I know that we attach our identities to our history and we mm -hmm. hold on to it long after maybe it would serve us to let go. Mm -hmm. I wonder how many people out there say, no, this is actually who I am. I think many. I think actually a very so sad, large amount of people would, would fall into that would area. Would fall into that area. Yeah. So Karen, w if people connect with you, if they reach out to you, and it's karenlesley.ca, Yes. Um, if they reach out to you and connect with you, what would you do with them if, if this is something they were struggling with themselves? Well, have a chat to begin with and actually just have them understand that they have a choice. And once people understand they have a choice, then they can move forward. Because by this point, many people are hopeless. Yes. And feel they've tried everything. Yes. Um, I'm kind of the last resort <laughs> for some people. Right. But that's okay. That's okay. Mm. And then helping them to rethink things a little bit. Some of the ways I work with people kind of gets in behind the logical mind. So then the ego and the memories that the mind works from can feel safe. Okay. Right? Not feel threatened that something too drastic is going to change. So and that their fight or flight. 
the fight like or flight actually kicking. calms down. Okay. That's very important. Excellent. Yeah. I love, I love that what you said is that to really teach each of us that we do have choice that we're not at the effect of these thoughts. Yes. That we can choose beyond them. Now, it yeah. may be hard in the beginning for people, mm -hmm. I imagine. You've noticed that. Yes. Even yeah. for yourself, you're a great example <laughs> of that. Um, but just knowing that we actually have a choice in this area, in all areas of our life. But yeah. this one seems like the most unlikely area that we have choice in. Yes, because we just, we're taught that we don't. Yes. And many people say, well, it runs in my family. Well, but what if that's not 100% true? What if you can actually be the person to change that? Right. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, Karen, you're doing great work out there. Thank, Thank you, you for sharing your story today. It's a very vulnerable story. Um, I'm sure it's not always easy for people to hear that are close to you, but it's also a gift for other people to learn about somebody else did it possibly I could do it too maybe yeah. I could change that as well. well thank you so much for having me you're so welcome please keep up the good work <laughs> I, I absolutely love it so do connect with Karen karenlesley.ca she is a facilitator of change not only for others but for herself as well fantastic thank you so much for joining us today please come back next week we will have another inspiring guest to share with you to contribute to you and your world. Until next time, remember, you can always make another choice.